When I say this, I say this with all due respect, I listened to Dr. Scott preach his Roman series. Many of you were listeners in, in the uh, sanctuary. And I think, I think I watched a transition happen for Dr. Scott going through the book of Romans. He got through the better part of half of the fourth chapter. But in the passages that he dealt with from verse 1 in the first chapter through the third chapter, I think something, strangely enough, and you might miss, some of you will say, well, that's strange, but I know I watched. I didn't necessarily understand, but I watched a new firmness come. It was the firmness that said to the congregation before he decided he was going to teach on Romans, it was the firmness that came when he said, this will sort out the congregation. In other words, the consequences belong to the Lord. Do you remember that? Yes. And if you watched that series, if you watched it or if you were listening, you, weren't, you were probably not thinking about the man preaching the message and how it affected him, but, but I did. And what I saw is something that I believe is happening to me, and I pray it happens to you as well, and that's you come to a point where you stand on God's word, and no matter what else is going on, this is God's word, this is God's promise to me, I'm going to speak for me, you can say it for you, and as that bold stand begins to take place, something else happens. You know, when we read about Paul in the 16th verse of the first chapter of Romans, where he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, I want you to think and make some comparisons to Paul, maybe even to Dr. Scott, and maybe even to yourselves. Paul, when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, of Jesus Christ, Here's a man who was jailed in Philippi, who was stoned at Galatia, who was beaten, who was shipwrecked. And he says, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, to any other person looking on, you'd say, that man was a crazy man. Because if all of these things are going to befall you, if all these things are going to happen to you, if all of this misfortune is going to fall in your life, something tells me there's something wrong with that gospel. That's how the world would look on Paul, and that's why... Paul wrote in Corinthians, he said to the Jews, the gospel being preached is a stumbling block, and to the Greeks it's foolishness. But if you understand what the gospel message is, especially for Paul, a Pharisaical Jew who understood not only the law, but the Old Testament inside and out, with every nook and cranny, I'm sure, in his mind, to stand and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We read this, it's not as, as a, it's not as revolutionary for us in this generation as it might have been for Paul as he said it, but I guarantee you, if you even let those words, which that's not even part of my text, but if you even let those words sink in, and suck in your breath for a minute, because I'm going to say something that's going to make you just squirm a little bit. How many of you can say that you've never been ashamed of the gospel? Don't raise your hand. You're in the house of God, so believe me. I don't want to have to have an Ananias and Sapphira person carry out the door. <laughs> We're going to ask the question again. How many can say they've never been ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Don't you dare hold up your hand. Because the reality is we've all had opportunities to open our mouth, and we knew deep down inside the Lord was giving us some, someone who needed consolation, not someone to bring to church to fill a seat, someone who needed consolation in Christ, and we decided to not open our mouths. Oh, we heard somebody ridiculing our pastor. I'm talking about Dr. Scott. And you didn't open your mouth. Now, long before I understood this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, I had moments and opportunities. At the very early on when I started attending the church, Many people were extremely critical of Dr. Scott. And people will find any opportunity they can to pull down. I, I, I'm going to ask you another question. This is a rhetorical one, but you know what I'm saying is true. The minute you cast your way, the minute you decided, this is it, there were people around you going, really? There's something wrong with you. 
Because that's not the way my church is, and that's not the way, you know, and they'll begin to tell you how it ought to be. And suddenly, if you're not careful, you'll coil back because the pressure of being socially accepted becomes very great if you're not standing on something like Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And what is this gospel of Christ? It's not a social gospel. It's a gospel that tells me that God made a plan for losers like me and like you. That's all of humanity, not some portion of it. Made provisions for his creation. Now, there'll be people that will still to this day come in the church and I either meet them, I'll talk to them, I'll encounter them somewhere, and they would like to tell me how someone has come to them and told them their sins are too grave, their past is too bad, they've messed up too badly, and I think, wow, these can't be Christians, because if they were Christians, they'd be reading the same book I am, and here's a man who persecuted the church of Jesus Christ, and God gave him the honor of understanding God's word better than any other person aside from Christ, not even Peter, not even James, Paul. And that tells me the grace of God. Now, there'll be people just like there were in Paul's day who will say, well, I'm, I'm ashamed of that. Well, I'm not ashamed. Now, it's taken me a long time to stand here and say solidly, I'm not ashamed. There are people who will say, well, you know, a church should be like this or the message should be like that. No, the message should be right out of God's book delivered straight to your heart as the salve that only God can give to bring men and women to salvation. Because what does he go on to say? For it is, what? The gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Reading the King James, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. In other words, God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care if you're black, white, green, orange. God says, this is who I will save. The sovereignty of God is declared right here in this verse. And I marvel. But then I think to myself, it's not a marvel that the church world is suffering. Because too many people are ashamed of the gospel of Christ to not want to preach it. And what does the gospel of Christ tell me? The gospel of Christ tells me that Jesus Christ was sent by the Father to fix something that only he could fix, that no amount of human works, no amount of human effort, no amount of goodness could fix the problem that began with Adam and Eve's fall, has much to do with the concept of free will that God created, and he didn't just wind everything up to say, now let it unfold, knowing exactly what we needed. And the record is given to us. I love this. The Old Testament record is given to us to show us that even when God gave a law, before he gave a law, he gave his word. Now, to those being delivered out of Egypt's bondage, which I referenced last week, to those being delivered, he said, apply the blood to the doorpost. There was no Ten Commandments then. There was no law, but there was God's word spoken, and you either heard it, listened to it, and lived, or you heard it, disregarded it, And, well, you probably don't have to worry about who was accounted for because they obviously died. End of story. So when we talk about what God has done, yes, he gave a law, a law, and in it, instructions revealing a lot about God and a lot about man. And we know that no man could keep the law. Now, this... I'm going to take something really complicated, simplify it for a minute, and then make it more complicated again. So stay with me, because I do that good, right? In giving the law, God revealed what he demanded of his creation, which he knew we were not able to perform. God said, this is the law. Don't think Ten Commandments. Think 316 do's and don'ts. Keep them all. You live, miss one, you die. I met somebody a couple of years ago who said, oh, I love the law. Well, good, you can live by it. (laughs) But for those of us who understand, the whole revelation of this book is to God's oracle people, first giving his word to them, giving them a promise, which he begun in Genesis 12, and it takes you all the way into the promised land, the very few who entered in to the promised land. And God, by the way, didn't just say, here, 
here's the keys to the promised land. Now, you know, take care. They went into that land, and there were Amalekites and all kinds of ites in that land. They had to fight for that land. It was not just handed over to them on a silver platter. And then as we go through the Bible, we see God's hand through history showing the people being carried away, the people being able to come back, the rebuilding process, the rediscovery of the law. And in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, we have the law is recovered. And as the law was read aloud, the people wept. Now, I don't know that they had the whole law, but whatever part was being read, they wept bitterly. And they began to keep the feast days again. Feast of Tabernacles, and each thing that they could read, they desired to do God's word. But even that, with that heart and that mind, would never be enough. Now, there'll be people that will say, when you come into the New Testament, that God gave his son to seek and to save the lost, and then they'll say, but you also have this law thing over here. But Christ said, I'm come to fulfill the law. So if you want to look at it this way, Christ raised the bar, he didn't lower it, he raised it. And all of it is fulfilled in him. That's why he said to those in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, thou shalt in no wise enter in. In other words, unless you can outperform them. And he was making a very bold statement, that is even theirs wasn't enough. And he says to these people, he says, you search the scriptures thinking in it, You'll find what you're looking for, but you won't. Essentially, you're blind to the kingdom of God standing in front of you. You think you'll find life in the letter. Now, Christ came in John 14 through 16, giving the promise of the Spirit. And we know that promise was poured out on a people. And Paul is that one born out of due time, not part of that original group of disciples, has his conversion on the Damascus Road, is turned around, now begins to be the heralder of the New Testament, of the gospel of Christ. So I ask you the question, which seems like I've taken this long road to get to, but if you were like the Apostle Paul, having that background, to stand and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, says something very bold about what he understood about the gospel of Christ. This is this, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, this text becomes the battleground for even to this day, not just between Catholics and Protestants. It becomes the battleground between how people truly understand the gospel message. Now, the next part of this, verse 17, is my text. I put it up on the board. For therein is the righteousness, King James, of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, I ask you a question. If you were here for the first time, a relatively new listener, you'd be looking at this and saying, I don't know, she said it was Greek. It must be Greek. (laughs) But some of you actually, for years of being around, recognize this text. How many of you recognize this text? It's a whole lot of you. Good. Half my, half my work is done. Not all, but half. But imagine if you were to see this very same text. You have it in your, in your Bible in English, I believe. The last time I checked, we're reading English. Never mind. It's a little language humor. I want you to know that if I was just looking at this, which happens to be the Latin version of the same text, I would be a little bit frightened, and I'll tell you why. Let's blah, blah. All right. I just wrote blah, blah, three dots. If I only had this, and I didn't have this, this being the Greek, and this is the Latin. Looking at the Latin text of verse 17, we have this word, justitia, and it becomes very clear to me Dr. Scott did many messages on this, but I I think I had not even connected the dots back then. That if I was studying the Bible through the medieval church, through the days when the Latin text was preeminently the text of the church, not English, of course, and Greek had faded into the background, and I was looking at this text, which our King James reads as 
for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Well, the thing that I might see first is this first word, and let me just say that yus is the prefix for our because there was no j in uh, Latin, where we get our juice words, justice, um, even our jur words, they're attached. This actually, the r part of jur is the, the, usually the genitive case going forward for all of those root words, but jus and jur, for we get a lot of our legal words. So if I was looking at this, I might actually, without knowing the Greek, I might actually think that what was being said was a justice of God, which brings me back to something. Don't think I'm going to teach on Martin Luther every week, but it brings me back to this because it was his understanding of this text that not only shook the world, but it was his understanding of the text, of this text, that brought great controversy into the church. Now, unless you're familiar with church history, you might say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that up until this point, if I were to break down uh, a little bit of a timeline in Luther's life, I'd say, contrary to what most people say, up until somewhere between 1514, maybe as late as 1518, prior to that, Luther held the Roman Catholic position, and he looked at this scripture, and he hated God because he viewed God through the eyes of this scripture and many others as a God who meets out justice, as a judge, a cruel judge. And he wrestled very much with how he could find peace within his soul, his travail of the soul, if you will, that was afflicted. Now, many people like to tell the story. It's in Daubigny's history recorded this way, but I guarantee you it did not happen this way. In fact... <clears throat> Some people like to say that it was during his trip to Rome in 1510 or 11 that this scripture came to him, although that's a nice tale. That's not the way it happened. And there's a reason for me saying this to you because we know for a fact, as we trace Martin Luther's work, he did the Psalms, Romans and Galatians, not once but twice. And if you have a commentary on Romans by Luther, and you read this verse, Romans 1.17, you'll see there's virtually not too much in it. Very little commentary in the first go-around. And where he seems to have picked up speed on this verse is when he gets to Galatians. He said, I'm married to the book of Galatians. He picked up the same theme because this verse, later on, the just shall live by faith, appears in Galatians as well as in the book of Hebrews, as well as in the Old Testament, Habakkuk. But if I was... Just taking a page out of Luther's life and trying to say, why should I give two seconds to stop here and explain this text? It becomes very clear that even today, people will read the text. They don't read it in Latin, of course. If you do, I feel sorry for you. But they'll read the text, and they will look at this word, justitia, justice. And it becomes very clear that this whole verse seen in that light, burdens us down with how can we possibly be right with God. In fact, I was going to start off by asking the question because I think it's the burden of mankind. How can I be right with God? Have you ever heard somebody, I'm sure you've even done it, I've done it. You get off track and then you say, I've got to get right with God again. You ever said that? Come on, show me your hands. Well, this is how to get right with God. Now, there'll be lots of people that'll tell you, well, the, you know, the way you do this is, and they've got some newfangled thing they want you to do, but the reality is there's only one way with God. And I love the fact that <clears throat> if you're willing to discipline yourself to read a little bit of history, you find out how controversial Martin Luther's interpretation, which essentially influenced even the translation that you have in front of you in your King James. Strangely enough, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute why I say that, because it's still not a good translation, but it's, it's influenced by Luther in one or two dimensions that we wouldn't think. First, let me say this. From Martin Luther's time, there was great controversy, obviously, in the church, but there could be no more controversial time than right after his death. A year before his death, in 1545, the Council of Trent met 
And it's at this council that lasted, by the way, for 18 years. Hello. Is it over yet? Are we there yet? (laughs) It lasted for 18 years, but don't think that they met and they had lots of spiritual decisions because half of these meetings were just full of ritual, pomp, and circumstance, and nothing got accomplished. But in the sixth session, they kind of made some bold declarations. You see, the Council of Trent was the counter to the Protestant Reformation. So when I begin to read certain things to you, uh, right out of the council, I'm not going to read the whole thing because I'll put you to sleep, but some of the things that are said really will provoke you, hopefully, as they've provoked me to say, wait a minute, that's not what my Bible says. And this has been the whole fight of interpretation through this whole time period, probably before, but certainly during the Reformation and continuing on straight till today. The Council of Trent said, but no one, in chapter 11, no one, however much soever justified, ought to think himself exempt from the observance of the commandments. So the Catholic Church was teaching faith plus the commandments. Wherefore, no one ought to flatter himself up with faith alone, fancying that by faith alone he is made an heir, who will obtain the inheritance even though he suffer not with Christ, so that he may be glorified with him. It's these statements that were made, and it gets better. Wait, there's more. I just highlighted the stuff that I really wanted you to hear, because you'll, for those of you who know your Bible, you'll say, wait a minute, what you're saying is this really was probably the most important text that Martin Luther lifted out of the Bible. And I'm going to say, that's exactly what I'm saying. In Canon 9 of this meeting, it says, If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining of of the grace of justification, and that is not in any way necessary that he may be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. In other words, you can't come into the church and simply be saved by faith because if you say that that alone is what saves you, you are accursed. Canon 10 says, If anyone saith that men are just without the justice of Christ, and notice the word justice, whereby he merited for us to be justified, or that it is by that justice itself that we are formally just, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. Now, you, be, you begin to see why I said to you a couple, two weeks, three weeks ago, you must know what you stand for. It doesn't mean you go out in the room and say, hey, no, I'm here. It simply means that when things come your way, you know why you believe what you believe. And this is kind of like uh, Bush's axis of evil here because it, it just keeps going. Everybody's anathematized here. Canon 14, if anyone saith that a man is truly absolved from his sins and justified because that he assuredly believed himself absolved and justified, or that no one is truly justified but he who believes himself justified, and that by this faith alone absolution and justification are effected, let him be anathema. Now, you have to understand, and I could keep going, I highlighted all the stuff in pink that were like the most uh, relevant parts of this to say this is what the battle was. Now, you see, when you follow the history of the church, you can understand why I was describing to you the subjects of penance. And we talked about, in some other cases, indulgences and sacraments, etc. That if not understood, the backdrop of this would say, well, we've got to find some place to make you do a little bit of work. Now you might say, what are, what's the background? What, what scripture do these people stand on? It's very crafty. If you read this whole council, it sounds very spiritual. Up until you get to the anathematized part, it sounds very spiritual. But this is what, and you're gonna, I know I'm going to get a few chuckles here, so I, I'll, I'll, what you do, do quickly. Uh, <laughs> the text that they're using preeminently to make an application is out of James. Now, you know why Luther didn't like James and said it was a strawy little epistle, not one word of gospel. And for this very reason, because the, the church used the following verses, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? 
And of course, they latched on to this and made that sound doctrine. And I love the fact that if you're going to make that sound doctrine, then you've got to go with a couple of these things in here. Like, was not Abraham our father justified by works? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely not. I'm just funning with you. What I'm trying to say is that this particular verse of scripture is not not only the clarion call, but an absolute, if somebody understands this, all the other stuff disappears. You cease to have the pressure of what Luther fought through in the Latin understanding. You see, also at the Council of Trent, they made the Latin Vulgate canon the absolute preferred canon and Bible for use. That means that every translation that came out of that had to flow from the Latin stream. Now, when you come into the Greek, this is the word your King James is translating righteousness. Now, you know, I have a very curious mind. I watch Dr. Scott pick apart this word, and I still could not make several connections. I had to go way back to do some Fishing. So if I bore you for a little while, you'll have to forgive me, but there are some of you here that say, yeah, I want to know about this. And the rest of you that don't want to know, I'll wake you up in a couple of minutes. So, this root here, DK, and the A, by the way, makes it feminine. This is a noun in the neutral feminine singular. This makes it feminine. This word DK has a very interesting history. I will not describe it the way Dr. Scott did. (laughs) If you weren't here, don't worry about it. He said she was a real nice lady. (laughs) Had my fingers crossed when I said that. Okay, why is this important? Because if... Let me do this first. So the people who are not familiar with this will say, I get where you're going now. Our English reads righteousness. If you translated from the Latin, you would get the word justice, justice or justification, which are two different words. And their source from which they flow, the understanding of which has subtleties that are important for us to understand. The question is, how did the Latin get to justitia, or how did the English get to righteousness when neither one of them even remotely look like this word, dikaiusuni. So you almost have to follow this word back a little bit. And as you go back and you follow the, the way the word progresses, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. I think I will go to my tablet to do it because I will make better drawings on my tablet. All right, here we go. So let's take this word, dk. That's the root we're looking at. The first thing, before I get to this word, let me say that in Greek mythology, and there's a whole history back there of mythological figures, but there are two or three figures that stand out preeminently. Mythology, all right? So in mythology, you've got Themis, Zeus, and Dike. Oh, there are many other people, by the way, but in in the mythological realm. This is important because these names, we're talking about mythological writing, we're talking about ancient Greek, the way the ancient Greeks understood Themis, who, by the way, I always thought Themis was a male, but Themis is a female. And how do I know this? Because Themis was a consort of Zeus. Let's put here, for the sake of understanding and clarity, divine origin. And we'll also say that Themis will be an establishing force, establishing force, And if we think about it, Themis was understood in the mythological realm as organizing the stars, the seasons, as putting all things in order. Dike, who is a daughter of Zeus, also had a title as goddess of justice. Now, some people confuse Dike as blind justice, but as the uh, figure 
sometimes presented. We'll leave that one alone because I'm not interested in camping out. But there's something that interesting that happens that will actually stream into our language frame that will influence this word and help us understand something about this word that the only other way to understand this word would be to go back to the Hebrew translation into the Greek, the Septuagint. So let's start from the Greek and see if I can try and make something that is somewhat complicated more complicated. <laughs> All right, just trying to keep you smiling there. All right, so let's, let's do this. So I'm interested in the Proto-Indo-European languages and how these will develop. And you might say this is going to be very complicated, so suck in your breath, I'm sucking in mine, here we go. From this root, themis, we get words that have derivatives of de. And this word, de, will come into the Latin by way of the Sanskrit in words like dharma. That into the Latin language frame will become, I was just going to write French, will become law, strangely enough. I was going to write French, loi, loi, there we go. From this language frame, I'm going to show you a relationship. DK is actually, this is the way you would find it. If you were tracing etymological roots, you would find it as D-E-I-K. And in the Greek dictionary, you will find it with an ending, diknumi, which is to show. So the question is, that dikaiusune, what exactly does that mean, streaming from this word DK? And I should talk about DK a little bit. DK, from that language frame, you're going to trace some interesting developments. These developments, DK was the overseer of relationships, I'm going to try and say it the best way I can, between tribes. So if Themis was overseeing all people, directly, DK was over the relationships between tribes, people relating to one another. And the key word in what I just said is relation or relationship. So if you, if you say, well, what on earth did you just say? The first thing I want you to remember is that this word has a connection somewhere to relationship. Relationship or relating. Not etymologically, but in the sense of how the word might have been understood. This word, diknumi, which comes from dike, this word, something interesting is going to happen. If this is to show, and the Greek, if you looked in a Greek dictionary, you'd see this word, diknumi, to show, it could not be simply to show with the finger as in pointing. It would have to be to show in a declaration of words. So we'll see a development that happens when you start studying the development of this word. I'm going to try and make this as easy as possible. Let's pick a new page so you don't have to look at blurries here. All right, here we go. So first, to show, number one, to show, but must be verbal, which takes us to a, that should be without a curve. That takes us to something that looks like this. Remember, we're still looking at this Derivative, dik, takes us to dis, which in the Indo-Iranian, you don't have to remember this, I'm just telling you where I got it in case you want to go check me out, would be to teach. So in showing by virtue of teaching, which would be something transmitted orally, relationship. Second, another example of this going down would be this, this word, C combined with the Latin prefix eudex, which will come from this word for which we get our English word judge. That's the best and the crystallized way I can do this. You coming from eus or your, where we get our words, as I just said, jury, judicial, whatnot, but dex from to say, dear, desir, and all of those language streams. So what is certain is that whatever is being said is understood in a relationship and in a dialogue, in something that is being declared. 
So when we go to try and sift down this word, if you understand why I'm searching for something, it's because I normally have a word to grab hold on that I can say, well, this came from this and this developed from that. We can't do it from the Latin because the Latin leads me back to simply a judicial stamp that says, that's the law, that's that. So tracing this back, what became clear is if I understand the relationship that Themis might have had, even in a mythological way, as relating to people overall in control of the universe, DK had this relationship between people and tribes. And it was a relationship of communication. Not necessarily, as people have formulated ideas, not necessarily making every end become nicely tucked together, but rather, let me show you this another way, so you'll see why it's, it's frustrating because I believe that once we understand a little bit better what this word represents, you'd have to go to the Hebrew to look at the word tzedek to know that that word, by and large, being translated righteousness, but will seldom, if ever, weigh in exactly on the justice word. It'd be like this. Let me give you an example. The French has a word that comes from this frame. The French says jury. That means to swear. That means to, to swear an oath. That's, that, this word is not oath. Who speaks French here? Who have a French person somewhere? Jurer. Je jure. Je jure quoi? Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire ça? Je jure. To swear. I swear. But it can also be jurer. I swear to tell the truth. It could also be to blaspheme. It can be to promise. So you have this word that comes from this. But when you go to speak about the oath itself, if you were swearing an oath, you would use this word. Not even the same word. It's completely disconnected. So I'm searching for root meanings, and then I find that in this word, the kaiusuni, the first thing I understand is from DK, I do indeed have a relationship. And it, it does carry with it a judicial concept, but it is more of a forensic declaration. It is more of establishing a relationship that is being declared from the declarer, if you will. Now, take all of that idea and put it back into the text. We have a righteousness. There's no definite article here. The King James has a definite article, but no definite article. So we have a righteousness, the kaiusuni gar, for, of God, theo, of God, in it. In what? Go back to verse 16. In it, a righteousness of God in it. That is, for it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Just reading straight King James. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. That is the it we're talking about. When people say, how can I be right with God? It is this... Think again of what I just described here, a declaration which is forensic, which, by the way, I'll go back to explain the difference between Protestant and Catholic in a minute so that it's clear. A declaration to a people, righteousness, a righteousness. Now, there was righteousness revealed in the law, but no man could keep the law. There was a righteousness revealed. If you go through the Bible, you'll find a righteousness a dimension of God, a dimension of the many sides of God in his names and the way he revealed himself. But a righteousness, a particular righteousness, for of God in it, that is, in the gospel, and the gospel is not the gospel about Christ, it's the gospel of Christ, telling us what Christ came to do, is revealed, apokalupteti. I love this word because, yes, I know, not more grammar, just a simple one. That's passive. It is revealed, it is unfolded, it is unveiled. Ek pisteos, eis pisten, from faith to faith. It starts with faith, it ends with faith. And if you think about all of this, it is a relationship that apart from the gospel, apart from hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, one, according to God's word, cannot be saved. Now, don't, don't take up the argument with me and say, well, well, if people don't know about Christ, can they still be saved? That's the age-old argument. 
Christ came to reconnect, to reconcile, to fix what was broken. He was the ransom. And now a righteousness apart from works. You know, I, I don't understand. Many years ago, there was a couple of people in the church, they said, Pastor Scott is preaching works. Now, I came out of that background a little bit, but I understood something real quickly when I began to read the Bible that I got for the first time, and that is that passages like Ephesians 2.8 say, we are saved by faith through grace and not of works, lest any man should boast. That was abundantly clear to me. That no matter how good I'd like to be and how much I'd like to do, or how much I think I ought to do, or people tell me I ought to do, none of that counts for anything towards my salvation. If you want to go out and do good deeds better than doing bad deeds, hey, go ahead. But that's not part of your salvation. And the whole argument in the church was rooted in these scriptures, these two verses, but specifically verse 17. Because, you see, the Council of Trent made sure to say, oh yes, a person is saved by faith, but listen, you also must do, this is the, the key word, you must do works of penance, you must show works of contrition, you must contribute, you must do. Well, Jesus said, you be known by your fruit, and I'm not, I'm not your fruit inspector, but God is looking down, he knows what belongs to him. And I've said this, I don't know why it was so difficult for many people to see this. When God's Spirit takes up residence in you and you become the house of faith, because you have heard in it the good news, declared righteous. In that very moment, I believe as things begin to change, they don't, may not change immediately, but as things begin to change, you may begin to do things that you previously would not have done. Is that true for you? Yes. Well, that's true for me, so I know that to be a truth from God's Word, which is I didn't try and do something started happening. And I wasn't saying, no, I was just saying, really, I'm not even aware of it. I saw people that hadn't seen me for a long time and said, boy, you really changed. Now, you see me all the time, but I've met other people who I haven't seen for many years, and they'll say, boy, you really changed. And I'll say, really? <laughs> I don't say that. I'm just pulling your leg. But what I want to say to you is this. This became the, really, the, the, the point of contention and as I said last week, the reason why I said about Martin Luther's writings in 1520 is because these writings made it abundantly clear, especially his writing on the freedom of a Christian or to the Christian nobility is another one or the Babylonian captivity. But this particular one, up until that point, he really crystallizes what it means to be made right, to be declared right. And he uses a diversity of scriptures, almost playing like a keyboard. If a person went into the book and began to read and began to analyze, you'd, you'd come away with scriptures like Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is made manifest. Or if you read through Romans, Paul is just, he's hammering home this word over and over and over again. It's, it's, it's like the most repetitious preacher because he keeps saying the same word over and over again and probably the crowning one is found in from from these issues is found in the third chapter when he says well, there's two places Romans 322 and Romans 325 Romans 322 even the righteousness of God which is again just reading King James by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe there is no difference for all have sinned. In other words, no amount, no amount of fixing yourself can get you in. Now, you know what I love about this scripture? I, I mean, I'm so excited about this. I love this for, for, for so many reasons. But it says, first of all, that no matter how much you think you might do, how much you, you might accomplish, how many things you think you might gain, Paul says there's only one thing that saves Hearing and receiving the gospel message, the gospel of Christ, not the gospel of social studies and not the gospel of how to feel better about yourself, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. His gospel said, if you're not willing to pick up your cross and follow me, you can in no wise be my disciple. 
We see, I'm not trying to be popular. I'm trying to preach with the goal that if I even bring 10 people into the kingdom with me, that's 10 more people. And those ones that prefer to have some other gospel preached to them, they'll be like the Galatians, bewitched and lost. Now you can you say, well, I don't, I don't like that very much because I, I think I'm okay. Well, you can think all you want, but if you're not hanging on to this verse, which is in it, the gospel has the power and the only power, there isn't another power, there isn't another revelation. There are religions that say we have another revelation coming out of a spaceship <laughs> or the golden plates that were found. Then you can believe whatever you want, but I'm telling you right here from this word and you can read it for yourselves. Now, what is this polarization with the Catholics and the Protestants? Well, the Catholics came back and said, no, wait a minute. First of all, If this is even possible for someone to be declared right, in right standing, in right relationship with God, simply through the gospel of Christ by faith alone, then what they did was they said, well, then surely sanctification must be here as well. So we'll be able to see if that's true or not because of your behavior. Well, wait a minute. Anybody who's ever laid out the book of Romans knows you got the first chapter deals with sin, You keep going, you've got the message of salvation, you've got the message of sanctification, and the message of service. And that's how the book is divided up. So if you want to talk about sanctification, keep reading on. But you won't find it right here because Paul lifts this out. Luther lifts this out. I'm lifting this out to say, don't get things confused. This is where God looks at Melissa Scott, I'll speak for me first, and says, no matter where you've been or what you've done, I love these people that say, I'm a Christian, and then they're the first people to throw stuff at me and say, well, you know, I've heard people say, she's, she's this or she's that. Well, so what? I mean, really, we all are that. If you want to start picking with me, let's line up our sins, and believe me, I'll be the first one to say, not only will I win the contest, I surpass Paul as the chiefest of sinners, but I'm also the chief recipient of his grace, and I'm fully aware of it, and make no mistake about that. So when people talk about this, to understand... What this means for you as a believer, it means your standing is on that gospel message. And what is the gospel message? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, that he did indeed. He was crucified. He said he was going to die, that he'd be raised up again. Indeed, was seen by many over 500 one time, ascended. He will be coming back again. And in the meantime, those who would deign to be bold enough to say, I'm not ashamed of this. Gospel of Christ, because in it, not in anything else, I don't care what you want to hang on to, but if you're not hanging on to this one thing, in it, leave here and say, what did she preach on? In it, lead you back to verse 16, the gospel of Christ. And make no mistake that a person is declared righteous. God looks at us for our faith. That's why I go into the rest of Romans and I see Abraham. And it speaks of him Think of this. Think of how crazy this is. And people say, oh, you've got to have, you got to do this. Abraham was before the law. There was no law. Before the law. Now, Abraham didn't leave a, live a pristine, you know, if he was part of the brethren, they'd be looking at him saying, well, you know, you lied and you messed around a little bit and, you know, that disqualifies you from being in charge. But rather, God knowing this man before the law, Gave him a word. He gave him a promise. Now, you want to see what the product of works produces? Read about Ishmael and the trouble of Ishmael and the trouble that Ishmael is still wreaking today because it's said of him he'll be, he'll live by the sword. That is where Ishmael still lives today, by the sword. I didn't make that up. That's in God's word. But the son of promise, Isaac, because God said, you will have a son, a child of promise, and I will give this son to you. And it will not be the son of works. It will be the son of seed of promise. And it was accounted to him righteousness. So imagine, we have this picture of a man before the law. People try to fit this in and say, but but doesn't there have to be some standard? Well, wait a minute. It says really clearly that Christ is the standard. Romans 3.23 says all, Christ is the standard and he's the glory of God. All have fallen short of that standard. That means no one can meet up to the standard without the covering. 
which is why we go back to the Old Testament to talk about the capareth and the mercy seat and the covering that Christ brings through his shed blood. So you know why this stirs in me a lot? It stirs in me a lot because I really feel that for the people who can listen, the people who will hear this on a replay, the people who can hear this on radio, get back to the gospel message. All of these other things, they're very attractive. They're very easy. They're very simplistic. They're very alluring, and they're designed for just that, the message of Satan that has permeated the church world now, to tell people either you must accomplish something and therefore works must be accompanied. How many times have people said to me, well, but what else does your church do? Well, I go to church on Sunday and I preach the word. Well, what else do you do there at Faith Center? Huh? What else do you do? You mean you do nothing? What kind of a church is that? <laughs> now, we shouldn't downplay that because... I come and I preach the word, and by faith I come. I come believing, faithing. Someone will hear the word, and a burden will be lifted. You know, people that walk around, they're completely yeah, bullied by other Christians around them. Oh, you, know, you ought to be doing this, and you need to be doing that. Or, you know, they'll tell you how you ought to be. At some point, you stand on this word, and you say, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I don't know what you're standing on, brother or sister. But God is not asking for me to be perfect because he knows that I can never be that and you could never be that, but he's asking me to trust him. These words, ek pisteo eis pisten, tell me, I, I describe this as the jungle gym. When I taught on this at some time back, many years ago, swinging from, from on the ladder, from rung to rung, because it starts with faith and it ends with faith and no one between this. Tell me if you see any space in between that allows for anything that do, do, make, do, do. <laughs> I don't see it. What I see makes it very clear. Now let's go back and look at the gospel of Christ from our Lord. And you take a look at the men and women that he spoke to. Did he say... You must go and do something. Each and every time he said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Thy faith has saved thee. Go and sin no more. What does that mean? Does that mean I can perform something? It meant consciously now, not what I might do. Keep me in your mind's eye. I, Jesus Christ, am the, the Messiah. Go and sin no more. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now imagine a whole church world today. Some of you had the good fortune of being steeped in this message for many, many months. I think it was probably a couple of years. But how many more people listening? That's why I said it's my earnest prayer. If this is the last time I ever spoke to you, and I went away today and God just said, okay, kiddo, it's time to go, I will have left you with what I think Every single Christian needs to hang on to, and it's the gospel of Christ. It is nothing else but the gospel of Christ. When we see Jesus, the Old Testament tells us God sent his word and he healed them all. Well, God's still doing that by his word. The word incarnate became the written word, which is now the preached word, which has the same power because it is the gospel of Christ. So when people say, well, I, I wish I could be right with God. Well, you start by faith. You don't start by saying, well, I'll clean up the house and I'll, you know, take a look at the, probably the crowning guy is Peter. Jesus says, after you come back, because he, he foretold, he did foretell that he was going to betray him. He says, after you come back, go and strengthen your brethren. But he didn't say to him, now, before you can come back and before you can get right with me, you've got to do so many things to show me that you're really, really sorry. Do you read that anywhere? It's what I said. And lastly, on this pinnacle of what I'd like to say to you on this message is this. You know, faith is a tricky thing. And I say it's a tricky thing because we can't see it. We can't, we can only grab hold of something with the heart and hold on to God's word. So there'll be people that will come and say, they've said it of me, I'm sure they've said it of you. Well, surely to stand on this message, you must show us. Well, isn't that what the Pharisees required of Jesus? 
Isn't that what those heathen that came said? Show us a sign and then we'll believe. Well, here there is no sign except the life of faith. And as the life of faith flourishes and you get strengthened in faith and you keep going from faith to faith, something radical occurs. And that that radical moment is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because in it, in that gospel of Christ, nothing else but in it is a righteousness declaring to me and declaring to you a righteousness of God. In it, unfolded, revealed, passively, I, by the way, receive it from faith to faith, which tells me all of these people who are busy troubling you or troubling me with my Christianity. I I look to Martin Luther and I get great strength in knowing that he turned the church world upside down with these scriptures saying, absolutely not, because what you do in the process is you negate the finished work at the cross when Jesus went to die, bleeding and hanging in open shame. You put it all to naught. You tread underfoot that shed blood. What I say to you is we live because Christ lives in us and we live that life of faith for what he did by one man's disobedience, that is the first Adam, the last Adam came to reconcile that we might have right standing with God and because of that, I and you have a right standing, a declared forensic stamped on me as long as I remain the house of faith righteousness that comes from God, not mine, mine is his filthy rags, but comes from God that declares to me, imputes to me, says stamped on you because of your faith, righteous, blood-bought one, precious in my eyes, precious in my eyes, precious in my eyes you are because you are the house of faith. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.